So we're going to have an update from CISA. So we'll have Jeff Hale, who's the director of the Election Security Initiative, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, as well as Kim Wyman, who's the senior election security lead um, at CISA. All right, I think that's my cue. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, and uh, hello, NASA. Uh, congratulations to the uh, incoming board members. I'm uh, very happy for you all. And we all know that Michelle Fascinary has the best chair in the cycle, uh, being past president, or soon will be. But uh, uh, first, I want to start by thanking both Michelle and Amy for their incredible, tireless work leading NASA and for their leadership in the subsector. <clears throat> excuse me, Government Coordinating Council, and for all of their guidance and the advice they've provided to the team here uh, through informal touch points and, you know, various calls and emails that keep us up to date. I can assure you that your membership voice is well represented here at CISA, and they are truly great advocates for your work and priorities. My team and I are also looking forward to working with incoming president, Megan Wolf. Uh, that's going to be great. So, um, I just want to take a few minutes this morning to talk about uh, what our mission is and where we're going. Um, over the past five plus years, since DHS declared election infrastructure as critical infrastructure, you all have been indispensable partners to CISA, to the department and to the federal government. CISA has been benefited tremendously from your feedback and counsel which has truly made us better at our work and more importantly, has led us to a vastly more secure and resilient election infrastructure community in this country. I'm gonna kick things off with a quick overview of our priorities for the upcoming election cycle. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Hale to talk more in detail about some of our current efforts, including new resources available to election stakeholders. Our colleagues at DHS Intelligence and Analysis are going to join us next week during the closed session to provide you with an update on the threat landscape, and we'll talk in detail about some of the additional products and services. For today's session, we want to leave plenty of time at the end for your feedback and questions. For the 2022 midterms, CISA has five key priorities. First, CISA remains committed to sharing actionable intelligence and information with you and your private sector partners in a timely manner and maintaining open channels of information sharing about threats and risks to election infrastructure. We, are also, we also continue to rely on you to share information you have on security incidents with CISA and the EIISAC so we have a more complete picture of what's happening across the sector. Second, we're providing the means and expertise to help you secure voter registration systems and information. The recent indictments of Iranian cyber threat actors, as well as lessons from 2016 and 2020, remind us that voter registrations and information remain a target for malicious cyber threat actors, which is why we offer free cyber and physical trainings and exercise services for election officials to enhance security, and resilience of election infrastructure. Third, beyond voter registration systems, we're redoubling our efforts to promote strong cybersecurity practices across the election infrastructure section, <laughs> sector. Sorry. While the sector has made incredible progress in this area, there's still a lot of room for growth. Core cyber hygiene practices like multi-factor authentication and faster patching can go a long way to protecting against cyber threats. Fourth, CISA is expanding our efforts aimed at building societal resilience against mis, dis, and malinformation in elections. I know all of you are facing unprecedented levels of MDM in the post-2020 environment. This includes narratives being pushed or amplified by Russia, Iran, and other adversaries as part of malign foreign influence campaigns that seek to sow discord in our country and undermine public confidence in our democratic institutions. This combustible information environment has put you all in an incredibly challenging position, forcing you to spend considerable time, resources, and energy on voter education and broader communication efforts. It is also contributing to the harassment and threatening behavior many of you are now confronting. And that brings me to my final priority. 
in partnership with the Department of Justice and the broader national security and law enforcement community, we are expanding services and resources that help keep election officials and your voters safe and strengthening the physical security of the nation's election infrastructure. I know this one is personal to many of you. It's personal to me as well. I've touched on it here, but I really want to emphasize that CISA is here to serve you. We at CISA try our best to be your voice within the federal government, and I am here personally to serve as an advocate at CISA and across the federal government. I'm here to serve as your advocate. If I could read, this would make it so much better. <laughs> CISA is also a stakeholder uh, demand-driven organization. If there's something that we're not doing that you would like us to do, or something that we can do better, we want to know about it. I know Amy does a great job of that now, so please keep it up. I'm going to share my email and cell phone with you all at the end of this uh, briefing, but I want to hear your concerns and feedback on our work and products. Please do not hesitate to call, text, or email me day or night. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff, who's going to talk about our recent efforts on cybersecurity, physical security, and the MVM space, and we'll leave plenty of time to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thanks all. Um, the, uh, it's always a pleasure to speak with NASAD and Ben. I really look forward to the opportunity to, to meet with you all in person. Again, uh, I'm a federal bureaucrat, so I need my PowerPoint slides. Hopefully you all can see them. Um, th this aligns very much with what Kim was, was just addressing, but going into um, some of the products and, and resources we have available to you all and some of the new opportunities uh, for collaboration. Um, I have to acknowledge that uh, we are in the midst of heightened geopolitical tensions with the uh, aggression uh, towards Ukraine. Um, knowing that the actors involved, um, uh, there is a uh, campaign to help critical infrastructure to include yourselves, um, be better positioned against potential cyber attack or, or the effects of information manipulation. Uh, so please. Uh, take a look at CISA's Shields Up campaign uh, and be cognizant of uh, the, the recent joint cybersecurity advisory alert um, on uh, helping to uh, build resilience or, or mitigate the risks of uh, Russian state-sponsored cyber threat uh, to U.S. critical infrastructure. So leveraging um, some of the, the security controls that may help in, in the common tactics known by this actor. Um, also, in the vein of cybersecurity, I want to highlight for those uh, who haven't seen it, the, uh, uh, the latest trends report. So the cyber risk summary of the um, vulnerabilities uh, and vulnerability assessments, which says it provides for election stakeholders. Um, one of the key highlights here is a cool concept called known exploited vulnerabilities. Uh, I know that there's a lot of noise uh, being pointed at, at you all to patch this, close that, secure this, add locks, add big bars, add, uh, add glass cases to secure everything. Uh, this is a, a way of helping to um, differentiate the signal from noise um, and help you uh, make uh, incisive actions to close those vulnerabilities uh, that we know uh, advanced persistent threat actors have used. Uh, so there's a list that CISA maintains um, called our KEVs. Uh, and all of your uh, CISA services will, will highlight uh, which one of those KEVs are still visible uh, on, on your system networks and systems. Uh, so please take mind of that, um, uh, of the, uh, the known exploded vulnerabilities listings and take advantage of CISA services where, where possible. Uh, Kim referenced uh, our focus on continuing to help you all secure uh, voter registration data and voter registration databases. Um, one of the um, best fit services that we have for this purpose uh, is our web application scanning. Uh, this is a, a routinized scan uh, that helps to uh, identify configuration errors uh, and, and particular vulnerabilities on uh, database and application systems. Um, so please, if you're interested in anything we can do to help uh, advance the security uh, of how you protect voter data, uh, please do let us know. Uh, we'll also acknowledge that we continue to fund 
the Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or the EIISAC. Love that you all are, are, are active members uh, in the EIISAC. Uh, some of the um, products and services that the EIISAC has rolled out in the last couple of years seem to be of great benefit. Uh, we're all aware of the, uh, the uh, intrusion detection sensors, Albert sensors, um, which alert to malicious activity. Uh, they've gone steps farther to help um, help you secure your systems uh, at uh, a more defense in depth strategy. So going down to the endpoint uh, and providing endpoint detection and response and malicious domain blocking and reporting. Uh, please take full advantage of these services to uh, uh, to your communities where possible and uh, and report that if you are uh, finding benefit in them because we are constantly looking to uh, refine and improve our services to you all. Um, understanding that that cybersecurity is one of the, the hard security practices, um, uh, and uh, misdis and malinformation is one of the more abstract ones. I, we have been focusing our our efforts working with the government coordinating council um, to both uh, advance the uh, the available information on addressing um, misdis and malinformation. Uh, two recent products, joint products from the GCC and SEC, were a rumor control startup guide and a misdis and malinformation planning and incident response guide. Um, to some, these steps seem intuitive, uh, but there were a lot of considerations and lessons learned that CISA and other states have gone through uh, in administering their own uh, rumor control or myth busting sites, uh, ways of presenting information, uh, ways of citing information, uh, plain language approaches that we thought a document uh, and our thresholds for inclusion that we thought documenting in um, in joint guidance would be helpful. Uh, additionally, the planning and incident response guide uh, it walks through several considerations at different stages in preparation uh, to help ensure that election officials uh, can uh, most efficiently and optimally uh, prepare themselves to address a, an area of misdis and malinformation. Uh, we do, as CISA, intend to continue the rumor control site. We have updated it uh, a few times over the last year as we receive reports of uh, election infrastructure oriented misdis and malinformation. Uh, and we have uh, recently released a CISA Insights product, not focused on elections, but highly relevant to that Shields Up campaign uh, to understand that the actors involved in these geopolitical tensions uh, tend to leverage not just cyber uh, uh, tools, but uh, information manipulation uh, to support their aims. So advising election infrastructure and critical infrastructure to prepare for those threats as well. Uh, we do believe that in addition to the guidance that we've provided, uh, there are uh, ready steps that you can take, like uh, helping your jurisdictions move to a .gov top level domain. That makes it very easy for the public to know that, um, that you are working with a government entity, that they are engaged with a government entity uh, as a managed top level domain. Uh, we validate that the requesters are government entities, uh, and this um, simplifies and helps to position you all uh, as authoritative sources of information where possible. Additionally, we've worked on two uh, MISTIS and malinformation relevant trainings, um, building trust through secure practices. This is largely a chain of custody and uh, tracking, testing, and talking about the, the issues in administering elections and securing elections in a manner that can help to um, preemptively debunk or address common mis dis and malinformation, as well as a communications training of leveraging best practices learned from industry, um, putting it all in one place to help your election officials uh, make efficient um, uh, efforts in, in communicating uh, true information in, in a environment clouded with, uh, with disinformation. Um, knowing largely that misinformation is also um, inciting uh, a um, threatening sentiments towards you and your local election officials, um, I hope you all are receiving DHS's NTAS bullet bulletins uh, and understanding that um, the heightened threat environment is being fueled by several factors, 
including the online environment, uh, filled with false or misleading narratives. Um, and, and we certainly, as DHS issuing this, uh, this NTAS bulletin, uh, recognize a need to, to help support you all as critical infrastructure owners and operators and stewards of democracy uh, in protecting yourselves, uh, your offices, your staff, and your systems. Um, we have issued uh, a recent catalog of uh, resources uh, to address physical safety and security. Uh, we partnered with the FBI to make sure that you have uh, what is available across those um, uh, across the available government services. There, uh, uh, particular ones we'd like to highlight include the infrastructure survey tool and the safe or security at first entry assessment provided by um, CISA's field staff, our protective security advisors. I think you have the opportunity to speak to uh, one of CISA's protective security advisors and understand some of the trends that are observed uh, through many of the, the services being um, uh, being presented there. Uh, I, I think that, uh, or I've heard from many election officials that the, the best utility that they've found in these uh, physical security assessments is the ability to take the findings from those assessments and rapidly turn them into resource requests. Uh, they are oriented in a way that um, make for uh, efficient use uh, to um, for budget requests uh, to identify uh, and for grant applications to identify specific um, uh, use for physical security funds, uh, either new locks, bulletproof glass, uh, sensing and alarms, reporting. Um, uh, the protective security advisor to follow will go into greater detail on some of the common findings, uh, but uh, we are receiving um, positive feedback from all of the engagements happening there. Many states have, uh, have um, engaged uh, election at these protective security assessments, these physical security assessments uh, for each jurisdiction, both the election office and the storage location of their election equipment. Uh, and done that uh, through 100% of the jurisdictions. Uh, I'm not saying that everyone has to, uh, but this level of, of engagement uh, is, is truly remarkable and, and it is a credit to you all uh, and the importance of this physical security issue. Um, continuing in that vein, we do want to um, issue a new last mile product uh, to help address the uh, the physical security guidance uh, we have, uh, we will continue to deliver all all of the uh, existing last mile products, the um, the uh, emergent, uh, emergency response guides, the uh, election security snapshots. This is one that recognizes that many um, election jurisdictions uh, and states have uh, unique law policies and laws uh, to that. Um, shape what is uh, what should be reported. Uh, and so we have decided to uh, partner with you all and law enforcement partners and uh, whoever you want to to help uh, fill out these common fields uh, to to both educate those in your election uh, jurisdictions and make it easy for the uh, for uh, anyone who used this common product to understand who to report to how to report what is a threat, how to document it, um, and, and the type of expectations they can have um, in, uh, in helping to um, ensure the, the safety and security of uh, their election offices and personnel. This is, of course, a voluntary product. If you are interested in doing so, um, this will be available. Uh, the, the request information will be at the, will be provided at the end of this, but we are happy to do so and can turn these out fairly quickly if you are interested. And this is, of course, in addition to all of the continuing resources that we provide, uh, the election security, the clearances, the secret level clearances for uh, election officials uh, and the threat briefings provided at classified and unclassified levels, the cybersecurity and incident response where appropriate, um, our existing last mile products like the election security safeguards document, um, our election day emergency response guide to help document to whom um, the uh, jurisdictions should be reporting uh, under different uh, uh, 
incidents and emergencies um, and continuing to support our election day operations center and the EI ISEX virtual situational awareness room uh, to ensure that we have the most timely and actionable information and the ability to reach and push it out to you all and your jurisdictions um, in as rapid a manner as possible. Matt, we are happy to take questions. I always appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Jeff. Um, as a reminder, uh, NASA members can uh, either just unmute themselves uh, and ask, you can raise your hand, um, or you can put something in the chat. I have a question that I'll start with, and hopefully this will inspire others. Um, for the uh, .gov, um, I know right now, or CISA took over ownership of the program and it's free for election officials. Um, how do you expect it to be free perpetually? Um, and I guess then my other question would be like, what's the turnaround time on an approval process uh, for um, a DACA of address and what kind of adoption have you seen since you guys have taken over? So, um, since we have given, given the, um, administrative authority over the dot gov, uh, and we're able, um, to offer it at no cost to state and local officials, uh, we saw an immediate surge, uh, in requests. Uh, the timing depends on an organization's ability to provide all the necessary authenticating information um, for what well, we take great pains to ensure that we are not giving .gov accounts uh, to non-government entities uh, that would defeat the purpose. Uh, so there, while there are a couple bureaucratic hurdles, uh, the, the process is can be relatively um, smooth. We do um, attempt to keep this uh, uh, a, narrow uh, in the amount of .gov sites that we, domains that we offer, um, but are happy to work with you uh, on to waive or, um, or extend existing policies uh, to meet your needs. Uh, the immediate surge has died down some, and we have a consistent uh, level of requests uh, from different type of government entities. Uh, we will be happy to uh, surge and ensure that you all Get the support that you need um, should it ever become untimely. And, and I just want to add uh, a sales pitch, I guess. If any of you on this call are either newer and aren't really familiar with the .gov domain and why you should switch if you are not currently using it in your um, in your entity, um, the, the main reason is, is it simplifies your messaging. Uh, we have a, I'll use Kansas as an example. Uh, Kansas Secretary of State was starting to see uh, websites for voter registration popping up and the names of those were mirroring the sites that the Secretary of State had to drive voters to, you know, go to a, an actual government um, agency. And so uh, they want to switch to go .gov so that they have a simple message. You know that KansasVotes.gov is us. Anything else with any different extension is going to is going to be uh, potentially a, an actor that you don't want to give your personal information to. So it really helps you simplify your messaging, and it also helps you secure uh, all of your um, your domain names or your do do domain. So uh, just a, a little pitch for those of you who haven't gone over to .gov. I have a question. Jonathan Barbett with Virginia. Would that also include email addresses as well? That would have the .gov or is it just the domain uh, website? So you can set this up so that your email addresses uh, leverage that managed domain, yes. Awesome, because I could see a lot of problems with compromised personal email addresses as opposed to you know, a website which you can do a little bit more tools against, but a, an email address is a little more frequently used, I think. Thank you. Jeff, this is Cliff. On the on the web application scanning and the voter registration system scanning, is that a is that a service that you are providing for free? Is that a, does it become a routine monthly type of scan or is it an on-site scan that a one-time type of deal? 
Web application scanning is one of the no cost voluntary services that we provide uh, and we can set it up as a monthly scan uh, to be able to uh, provide you a snapshot in time uh, of your uh, of the security of that um, application being addressed uh, and then see the progressive change as new vulnerabilities are identified and or remediated. Hey, this is uh, Trevor Timmons from Colorado. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Jeff, for joining today. Um, I've got uh, a, a question. I know that CISA was looking at uh, some potential opportunities to direct funding uh, from DHS, CISA, the federal government. Uh, I know you were looking at potentially uh, uh, patterns around uh, cybersecurity navigators, uh, other things that really get those last mile uh, resources down to locals. I'm just wondering, um, uh, what's the status of kind of maturing, evolving, uh, some sort of centralized kind of uh, uh, kind of direction on that, and whether you have anything to 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 say on that? Appreciate it. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, so, CISA has been given uh, the the authority to issue state and local cybersecurity grants. Uh, this would be the first year. Uh, we don't have the specific guidance having uh, to go out yet. Uh, but that is being worked and I believe there will be forthcoming announcements soon. I see Megan has her hand up. Thank you and thank you uh, Kim and Jeff for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, and you know, it's really an impressive list of resources that you have available. Um, I think every time we have these conversations to see all of the different things that we really developed together uh, as election officials as, and CISA, I, I think it's really impressive. So thank you so much for taking our feedback and incorporating those into usable things for us. Uh, we, we really do appreciate it. One of the questions that's been coming up for me as we work through utilizing some of those resources is how can we message on the types of assessments that CISA may complete for us um, in a way that doesn't compromise um, the, the confidentiality of the results and things like that. Um, I, I find that often we're in a spot where we wanna talk about those assessments. We wanna talk about those partnerships. We wanna talk about all the things that we are able to do with CISA to secure our systems, but there's really not a good way for us to have those conversations. Um, so I don't mean to put either of you on the spot, but any thoughts about how we can message sort of the strength of those services and the types of things you look at when you do those assessments uh, without us getting into sort of the, the actual results of, of those, those surveys. So thank you, Megan, and, and congratulations on being the incoming president. Or, <laughs> uh, the, um, so the information that we provide to you all, uh, we are constrained from sharing. You all are at full liberty to share. Uh, understanding that um, the uh, we, we just ask that information not be modified from uh, from a CISA delivered uh, report, uh, but we have uh, recognized that some of that information um, is uh, technical in nature and difficult to understand. So this is why we developed the the trainings uh, on how to on both. Um, building trust through secure practices. So talking about how we can uh, in plain language, uh, <laughs> looking at me to plain language is not that this, this, this was developed by uh, by far better communicators than myself, but how through plain language uh, we can um, explain some of the more technical elements uh, of the security practices and safeguards in the election process uh, and our uh, mistis and malinformation communications uh, training deck in a dynamic environment. Uh, so it is uh, perhaps not exactly the the request that you're, you're making, but I do think those are two um, opportunities to um, start to meet the mail. And would we would be happy to take any additional feedback that you have uh, and help to um, meet the new requirements. Jeff, one question um, I have is about the Homeland Security Grant Program. Um, I know in fiscal 2019, I think elections were specifically called out uh, in that notice of funding opportunity. And then in fiscal 20 and 21, we were not. 
um, and not being named in that program has made it uh, more difficult for election officials to uh, get access to those funds. Um, I know this decision is not a, your decision alone, but I'm curious if you have any sense whether um, elections would be added back into uh, the notice of funding opportunity. Those Homeland Security grant programs are uh, um, administered by FEMA, and we all help to inform the national security priorities that go into there. I'd be happy to make connections to uh, the right individuals who uh, oversee that program, um, but I do not have any particular insights in that at the moment. I have a question. Um, switching back to like the last mile posters, I know that you know we've utilized at least one of them. I was just wondering what the time frame is. So if we wanted to participate in some of the other and, and collaborate on some of the other posters, um, what's the you know the type of time frame for that um, for us to coordinate that and to get an end product essentially? So we do this in uh, first come first serve, uh, and uh, we are. Um, somewhat bandwidth limited, uh, but right now uh, entirely available to uh, to support any request. Uh, we have delivered them in as few as three weeks, um, and some have taken longer on approval processes. So uh, it is largely to the tolerance of your your team's engagement and the ability to um, um, to come to a final product in a timely manner. But we will get them out into your locals as quickly as possible. Thank you. And I just also want to add and remind everyone that those products were designed to be able to be custom tailored. And I know that uh, in NASAD and I imagine in the uh, in NAS, we're going to see some changes of uh, uh, people and you know things are going to change on the ground in terms of offices. So if you want to update your your last mile products or you want to you know personalize them in a different way or make changes to them, they are also. Um, editable. So uh, just want to get that on your radar that you can also make changes to the existing ones you have and get replacement ones. I see Wayne has his hand up. Hi, right, Wayne Benna from Nebraska. Thank you all for joining us. Um, many of our bosses are getting um, emails about uh, top secret clearance. We can probably imagine that's a very invasive process. Uh, and I just want to know, uh, as we are giving recommendations to our bosses, whether or not to go through this, if it is actually worth it, uh, given what we um, already have available to us and maybe what would be the difference uh, if uh, our secretaries or our election administrators have a top secret clearance versus just secret clearance. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, the NDAA of 2019 um, uh, offered um, top secret uh, secure compartmented information to chief election officials. Um, we are happy to facilitate that um, uh, access to that, that information uh, in addition to the secret level clearances that we've offered um, across the uh, across the sector, more than uh, six uh, cleared individuals per state, um, the difference is usually a level of specificity um, that the intelligence can provide. Uh, but our commitment is largely to get all the information possible out as broadly as possible in an unclassified manner. Um, this is with more than 8,800 election jurisdictions. Um, it doesn't help to have only a handful uh, able to access information at a, at a highly classified um, environment. We do welcome having some uh, ability to validate and, and verify that we are uh, being honest brokers with this information and getting everything we can out. Um, so we, we welcome that level of oversight, if you will. Um, but understanding that the clearance process takes a long time, uh, has a, a long investigation, um, we would completely respect uh, if individuals choose not to pursue that level of clearance, and we will continue to commit to get them all the information they, they need uh, in an unclassified manner.
Do we have other uh, questions or comments for Tim and Jeff or Sissa? Let us hop easy. Wow. <laughs> I see Andrea from Wyoming has a question. Good morning. Um, just curious if a date has been determined for when the 2022 TTXs are going to be. Thank you. Yeah, we are looking for tabletop to vote. We have notional timelines between um, NASA and NASED in July, but we will uh, broadly propose. Um, a date and solicit feedback on that uh, on that proposed date in order to to find the most available uh, opportunity for the most participants. Excellent, thank you. Anybody else? All right, Michelle, I see uh, no other uh, questions or hands raised. So thank you. Um, thank you both Kim to Kim and Jeff for providing us with this information. It's always great to hear from you guys. Uh, we certainly look forward to also having um, more discussions with you in the coming uh, in the coming months as we head into these midterm elections. I think our um, having our, our relationship um, continually growing is is something that's going to be important for a success for all of us. Um, so we thank you for everything today and we look forward to um, future conversations.